Hey everybody, welcome to the Song Revolution Podcast, brought to you by Nashville Christian Songwriters. Nashville Christian Songwriters exists to empower Christian songwriters worldwide. I'm John Chisholm, and this podcast exists to bring you valuable songwriting insights, inspiration, interviews, and just all-around good fun with some of the greatest songwriters, producers, arrangers, artists, and creatives, and beyond. You can find out a whole lot more about us at NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com. Hey everybody, welcome to the show, and this week I have a very special episode because we have with us today Tony Wood. Tony Wood is a multiple Dove Award winner. He's had 29 number one hit songs in the Christian marketplace and counting. So I think you're going to learn a lot from Tony today, and I hope that you'll tune in for this very special Song Revolution podcast episode with Tony Wood. All right. Well, hey, everybody. The other day, I was scheduled to be with Tony Wood down on World Famous Music Row in Nashville at the Word (laughs) Music Building. But I got down there and dragged my mic stands and my mics and my cables in. And wouldn't you know it, there was a jackhammer. What? I don't know. Was it in the building? Uh, No, it was a half a block away, but that's the sound of Music Row these days. Yeah. And it was going da 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 Da, 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 da. It's like, no and, way. And then about twice a day, there's <laughs> blasting, where the whole floor and all the buildings for a couple yeah. of blocks just rattles and shakes. How yeah. funny. So now we're in Tony Wood's <laughs> home studio yeah. down in lovely rural Brentwood. Yeah. And, uh, Tony, thanks, man. Thanks for being here Thanks, today. John. Thanks for having me today. Wow. I, I really enjoyed listening to a number of the podcasts. feels like listening to some friends talk about yeah. just conversations that, that, that we have. Absolutely. And, um, I'm such a fan of songs and songwriters. Yeah. Well, as I said in the intro to the show today, you're just the quintessential fantasy story. And I'd like to just kind of dig in a little bit, uh, you know, to this, uh, you know, uh, with five Dove Awards, 29 number one hit songs and counting. Uh, Just some of the people that have sung Tony Wood songs are seventh time down, Mandisa, Mark Harris. Phillips, Craig, and Dean. I had yeah. a little bit of a hand in helping them get started back in the day at Star Song. Johnny Diaz. I love this girl's name. Francesca Battistelli. Yeah. Hawk Nelson. Pocket Full of Rocks. Travis Cottrell. Point of Grace. Michael W. Smith. Matt Redman. Big Daddy Weave. Yeah. Meredith Andrews. And how many are left? 21 or more besides that. So the list just keeps going. I'm so glad uh, you know, to be able to sit here and talk with you about this. Um, you know, obviously you've been at this for a long time, and uh, this kind of success just doesn't happen overnight for anybody. So, you know, why don't you take us back a little bit? Yeah. Um, I grew up in a small town in Virginia, Chase City, Virginia, kind of a farm town. And um, local church there was a, was a big part of kind of the social life for all of our friends. I think that was kind of the real music exposure, um, youth choir, things like that, hanging out after uh, choir. Because if we were going to go to theme parks in the summer, you kind of had to be in the youth choir to be a part of the oh, choir yeah, right? tour, to go to Carowinds or King's Dominion or something like Deal that. Deal fundraising, <laughs> car washes. All, all, all of that, yeah. And then go sing go sing the musical or whatever you're doing and then um, – and then go to the park for a day. So yeah. it's kind of, it's kind of just what we did is, is a way out of town in the sure. summer. But but exposed to a lot of church music. Gosh, mm-hmm. you know, I, as as a kid, I loved the hymnal for some reason. Really? During during, um, I loved hymns, to singing. But then sometimes during sermons, just sitting there flipping. I remember just uh, just caught up in the words of yeah. holy, 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 wow. what, whatever that was. About. You know, you're, you're like thirteen years old and not fully getting. What, what that hymn really deals with. Yeah. But just, it, it connects somehow deep. Um, Baptist church? Yeah, small Baptist okay, church in, right. in, in my hometown. And um, Well, before you go too far, yeah. what were the musicals you guys would sing? Because I think I'm probably a little older than you, but... You know. um, yeah, Celebrate Life, of sure, course, was, was, sure, was yeah, one of the big, big ones. One. Uh, mm-hmm. Reagan and, and Cynthia, course. just it was a great one. I, I don't know, it was, it was a number through the years, but like... Kirk Kaiser singing "Celebrate" book, right. all all of those songs. Quit pass it on when it was new. I was just about to start singing it. <laughs> it only takes a spot. All of those, golly, yeah. wow. just love those. Which were was really the contemporary Christian music of the time. That's 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 the late seventies, and um, it was just a it was a part of what what we knew. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, I got saved in 76. Okay. Like radically saved. Mm. Cherry Road Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. Th- that was what was, you know, the popular music. Yeah. I mean, those are some of the yeah. very first Christian songs yeah. I ever learned. A lot of Gaither things, mm-hmm. Dallas Home and Praise coming, right. coming along at that time. And um, and I started learning to play piano kind of th- at that time, too, in high school. And so those were some of the songs I'm learning to play. And then mm-hmm. hanging around after choir practice, just uh, playing friends, standing around singing. It started... Um, kind of recruiting several friends of, of mine that were in the in the youth group and um, who were who were good singers. I was never a good singer, um, right. but um, and have never improved one stitch. But um, <laughs> but but playing for them, it was like, hey, you want to do something Sunday night in church? And um, and so grateful for a church that gave us an opportunity to do that as right. as high schoolers to to play and for, for different people to sing. And, and out of that, um, started writing some at, at my church and, and then would go, hey, instead of doing this Kirk Kaiser song, will, will you learn this song of mine and mm-hmm. sing it? And um, and friends did and started just kind of going around to some to some local churches in the county, a couple of yeah. counties around um, and kind of had an hour long program that evolved into original material. Wow. Um, Do you remember your first song? Uh, well, I, the first song, like for everybody, was just bad love songs. Yeah. You, you write for whoever the girlfriend at the, ti- at yeah, the right. time was. Girlfriend I, of the month. I, yeah, I don't think there's a guy who's spiritual enough to sit down and start writing Christian music. You got to right. you got to get some of those out, out of your way. But then started really writing songs that were about what my friends in the youth group were going through. Mm. Um, that thing that writers do, you just raid other people's lives shamelessly. <laughs> and um, But you try to be really respectful with right, it. And so, right. you know, I'd never embarrass them with it, but I'd maybe pull them in one night and go, hey, I wrote this about that thing that we talked about the other night. And then play it for them just one-on-one to, to make sure they were okay before we, wow. before we went out and, and, and played it. Because, um, you know, one of the songs was, was about a buddy in high school that wasn't a believer at the time. And, and it was just kind of this... I, man, this thing that I, I want you to know Jesus like like I do and all that. And so mm. um, those were the kind of songs. And, you know, go, then going out to, to churches to, to, to sing those. And, wow. um, and, and, I, and I found out early um, that the creative part of that was what was satisfying to me. I, I didn't have to stand up and sing them but, because my friends were singing them. But the message getting out was wow. the part was like, okay, that, that works for me. That's very cool. And you actually just hit on one point that I uh, stress a lot to uh, my clients and in a lot of the blogs and all the stuff that we do at Nashville Christian Songwriters is to really be a stealth writer by, when you just said it, raiding other people's yeah. lives, yeah. Like really tuning into conversations because yeah. a lot of people say, well, I don't have time to write. Gosh. And it's like, you don't have time not to write. But, but the mean, antenna is up at, yes. at all times. There's the possibility yeah. you're going to say something in the course of this interview that's going to spark something in me. And I've done it long enough now that you're not going to be able to read it in my eyes. Yeah. That, I, that I'm not. I'm not going to give it away. Oh, that's it. Let, let me write hook. it down. That's but yeah, I'm not going to. Not going right, to do well, that. I get ten percent. Okay, you get a song. <laughs> you, a... you might not know. You, that's that's the thing with with writers are not safe people to be. A, yeah, but to you're be a Christian. A, <laughs> you're a Christian. You owe it to me. <laughs> oh man, that's fantastic. But that's yeah. a real principle, you know, yeah. to really listen, keep the antenna. Up. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, you write stuff of your life, but I mean, if you're going to write dozens of songs every year, everything can't be pulled from the fabric of your own life. We, yeah. I mean, we walk with God, and 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 it's a continuing, ongoing walk and learning new things. But um, boy, there's just so much in books and other people's experiences yeah. and their story to to shape and to tell. Hey, so. my life's too dull to get too many hooks from. <laughs> I kind of feel the same. <laughs> so, okay, so here you are, you're a kid, a teenager, yeah. all the youth musicals and stuff, you start writing, start having some success, it turns well, into this program. Yeah, I mean, we just, success, but it's, but it's just going out singing. It, yeah. it, it, it's, I, it's a it's a, it's about a principle that, that that I believe it's about being faithful where you are you at, at any time and and it's funny because you know I'll go back to my home church some and, and nobody cares about 
whatever the latest song or record that you're on anything with it, but they'll say something like, hey, you remember that song, whatever it was from 1970? Right. Oh, I just love that one. It's Do like, you remember that, that song where I told you my deepest, <laughs> darkest sin and, and you, you put it in a it. song? Yeah, and, and, you, sa- and you, sang your name and in the used chorus. my name, exactly. Oh. I still hate you for that, <laughs> Tony Wood. It's not that. Oh, it's that's not. hilarious. But you yeah. guys, so you had kind of a regional ministry going yeah. on, yeah. and then I, I remember reading in your bio about a pretty big decision that led you here and yeah well i mean that was kind of i didn't come to nashville till after college and so that really i kept doing that during college started still playing and singing with some friends and starting to you know to write a a lot of songs and to find that i was (laughs) becoming a a bit obsessive about it it was it was like um i went to a, a small college about an hour and a half from my hometown averett university and um and this is this is kind of the uh, obsessive part, but it's like I'd get the syllabus early on and, the, and then the semester, <clears throat> and I'd block out how to get. I was never a great student. I was like, I'll take a C, just just really? just just give me the free time to go do <laughs> just to go do what I want. And, and I would I would knock out the book reports and the term papers in like September, so that I would what? poorly poorly die, so that I would um, kind of have October November to. Sit in the practice rooms and yeah, okay. and just write, or sit in the library and just scribble into into notepads. You know, and and by the time I through through college and um, I went to seminary after after that, which was it was kind of like just a long extended school period. But I I was actually mailing some songs into Nashville at yeah, that time yeah. to to publishers, which you could do then and can't anymore. The, can those I, those days are I, those days are long yeah. gone. But I, I got letters back that kind of said, um, boy, this music is really bad, <laughs> really, really ordinary. Do not call it. Yeah, us. that kind of a thing. And But in it, there was, it wasn't really compliments, but, but, but they were a little more kindly disposed to the lyric than the, than the music. And I got, I got several letters like, like that. And it really... It really taught me something because because it made me look inside and I, and I you know what the part that I'm passionate about is the idea the concept what is the truth that we're starting that we're trying to communicate here um, and music was just a way to do that and, and I I kind of realized I could functionally write music but not at this now that I'm a, I walk in the room every week with guys that are just gifted, that are just mm-hmm. wired that way, mm-hmm. that I've just seen them pull melodies that are so far above and beyond good melodies. Oh, they're, yeah, they're just right? great. And, and it's like, okay, that's that's not a part of who I am at all. Um, so I so I kind of made a bet, well, not a bet, but a, but a decision to stop concentrating so much on, on the music and just... Uh, Focus more on, on the okay. lyric, and That's so even, even then, you know, I'm I'm in school, and I'm well. Well, maybe I can find co-writers. I mean, maybe there's somebody else because because I, I remember kind of thinking, I bet somewhere else in America today, there's another guy out there in Nebraska, Arizona, who got letters who said your music is better than your lyric. Mm. And I thought, man, if I could ever meet those people, if we could ever get together. So so I I just started really writing lyrics on my own without music thinking maybe I can walk in a room and give somebody this lyric and they'll they'll um, sit down and be able to, to, to sing to it and it at, at that time it really turned out to be a, a pretty good wager for me it took years for that to, to pay off to learn how to to do it really well Um but then to finally come here to town and meet and meet guys that would go, oh well, that just that sings like early on. We were, our first punching deal was signed about the same window of time that a guy named Scott Crepain did, who who was a guy in Seattle who who got those letters about, hey, your melodies are really good. Not sure about your lyrics, and then to to on a regular basis sit down with him, give him words, and he just starts playing and singing, mm. and it's just like these these sheets of typed paper that had lived in my backpack for a couple of years were suddenly coming alive wow. right before me. Just, that must have been amazing. Oh, loved it. So grateful. Mm. I mean, for, for guys like him, but, uh, but a lot, and a lot of guys, but um, just 
for God's faithfulness and goodness in making the connection in time, not not on my timetable. You know, I wanted it. I wanted those connections when I was I know, back right? in college. For real. And he's like, no, let's get through college. Let's get through grad school. Let's uproot the family, move to Nashville. Let's take a couple of kind of plain, nothing happening years there. And then I'll start to introduce you. So it's like, oh, yeah, like 10 years after I really wanted it to happen. Right. But, 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 you know, in his faithfulness and his goodness, I'm so grateful. Wow. Yeah. So were you a music major in school uh, the first time? Um, I was really more of... I'm kind of a ministry major. I also love uh, student ministry. Um, just I think just because of the way that I was raised, church, youth right. ministry, music was such a part of it. Um, so I uh, served at a church here in, in town for about a decade as, as student ministry and worship leader right. there. And while you were kind of getting your songwriting, kind of kind of, kind of getting going, going with that, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. also for in a couple of churches before I moved here to town too. That's yeah, cool. So, so was meeting Scott your first big break, or what? How did that happen? <clears throat> um, the thing that was significant for me when, when I came to town, because my wife and I moved here knowing absolutely nobody. Yeah, it was just a leap of faith. Uh, it it was, yeah. I mean, felt like we, that's what God wanted you to do. Yeah, when I was graduating, we'd been married for about a year, year and a half. And it's like, okay, we can settle anywhere. How about Nashville? <laughs> and we were both sc- Why not? scared to death. Because both of our, our families are, are in Let's Virginia. Let's see. And Nashville, Muskegon. <laughs> Nashville, <laughs> Muskogee. Where are we going to go? The whole world's coming to Nashville now, but it, but it, wasn't, know, it right? wasn't quite that way then. Um, <laughs> so we did. Um, and I took a, I, I took a uh, there was a seminar that ASCAP was offering, like six or seven Monday nights in, in, in a row. And there were um, different panels, Christian songwriters, where where they'd have a bunch of writers one night come and talk, a bunch of publishers one night, a bunch of mu- music, studio musicians, just kind of giving an overview of the Christian music industry. And um that was that was the first time I'd ever had a song critiqued in a in a public. Oh, man, sense. were you freaking out? Oh, oh, John, just talking about it right now, I feel <laughs> what I felt. The vulnerability oh, yeah. of that of of never having played a song oh, yeah. professionally for for any of all, not professionally, but trying trying sure. this professional connection, and 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 it's just this dinky little piano work tape and um and they cranked it up so loud in the <laughs> ASCAP boardroom you know about four people sitting up front and about 30 people in the class and you just feel completely You're naked sweating and just dying yeah and you know what and in the 5 minutes after that in their comments I learned more about songwriting in that 5 minutes than I had in the 5 years before that um just the way that they broke it apart and showed me some things that were wrong and said, this is the choice you made and this was the better choice. And I was just, you know, it was worth it for the pain. That, that, that's the, the vulnerability and all that was awful. But what they taught me after that was just so worth it. I, mm. I appreciated that. Wow. At the end of that, at, at the end of that um, conference, a thing that had... Um, that scared me. One of the writers there that night, I, th- I think it was, uh, I think it was Dwight Lyles, who's, who said, I, I know y'all have worked together a lot, s- said, um, the hardest meeting to get in Nashville with a publisher is not the first meeting. The hardest meeting to get is the second meeting. And that terrified me because as it, I'm, I am an introvert, as most, as most creatives are. And so the thought of walking up and introducing the, the, the whole networking word just oh, it terrifies me because it feels like walking up to a stranger going, hey, I'm Tony and you need to meet me because <laughs> and I don't have a bone of that now in my in yeah. my body. And then and then with Dwight's comment, it just made the wall that much mm. higher to get over. It's like, well, I don't want to I don't want to be premature and I don't want to, um, you know, make the bad first impression and then have to get over it later. Uh, I stewed on that for a month or so, and um, <clears throat> so the first, you know, they're just this kind of cowboy, mo- cowboy up moments along the way where you go, okay, I got to do this. So I called Tom Long at ASCAP and I said, hey, I was in, the, I was in the, gosh, so grateful Such a for great him. Guy, yes. And um, and I and I said, I was in the, I was in the class that you were offering at ASCAP. Somebody said the hardest meeting to get with a publisher is not the first, but the second. Um, Tom, I want to, I want to know when the time is right. I don't trust myself. I need somebody to tell me. Here comes the question, 
Tom, will you be that guy for me? And, and Tom said, well, nobody's ever asked me that. Um, why don't you, let's meet every four to six weeks, bring me the lyrics that you're working on um, at that time, and, and let me take a look at them, and I'll tell you. I was like, okay. So I go back home, call Tom in about a month, and say, okay, I'm ready to show you some things. And I walked in, laid three pieces of typed paper on on the desk for him and stood there trying not to twitch or move or anything (laughs) while he reads. He reads, looks up and says, I know some people you need to meet. Get in the car. And it it freaked me out (laughs) internally for a second. It really did. I've told people, just the honest truth is, I said, hey, Tom, give me a a minute. And and I went to the bathroom and I cried. I was so so overwhelmed by this is this is it this is meeting a publisher going hey please like me yeah, all, all yeah, of that yeah. tom took me around to to four publishers at the, at the time and and three of them kind of said no thank you and um the fourth one was a guy at, at Lorenz Creative Services at the time. Uh, Michael Perrier, who was working with Steve Merrill and Lorenz and Elwin, Elwin Raymer. Yeah. And, and I think because Michael himself is a lyric writer, I think yes. he kind of got where I was coming from. Yeah. And, um, and he kind of he saw what I had. And he said, well, hey, why don't you just start hanging out here some? Let me see if I can get some of our writers to, to write with you. And... Um, that was kind of the, that was kind of the be- so the cool. beginning right there. Yeah, it's just a slow build of a relationship. You know, I just show up trying not to be a pest, and but he started putting me. I mean, he had they had some great writers. That I mean, Greg Nelson, Phil McHugh, some of the early Stephen Classics. Curtis stuff, yeah. Scott Wesley Brown, oh, yeah. Dick and Mel Tunney. It's like people that I'm just like in awe of what they're doing. Mm-hmm. This is this is like early nineties. Um, in in Christian music, but but also some some new guys coming through the, through the door, through the door at that time. A guy named Danny Myrick and I were put together for a lot of things, and 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 Scott in that time, and and Kyle Matthews and mm-hmm. some other people that you kind of come through the door at the same time with, and and learn and work your way up. Right. So that was the beginning. Wow, Michael is just a legend. Uh, he and I actually wrote a song together. Was it early this year or late really? last year? It's just in the, been in the last six or eight yeah. months. I forget. But he's been a, he's been a good friend from from you know as long as I've known him in, yeah. in in Nashville. And he is kind of the one that I credit with the the beginning of of every good thing that's happened. That is so cool. And I, I, there's so many elements to your story, even up to this point, that I think are really really awesome and but critical in the sense that uh, you were following God's leading, but it was a process, and it wasn't something that just— And it was slow. It's slow. It, it didn't drop on you overnight, <laughs> right? <laughs> no. I was, I was signed to Lorenz as a staff writer for a couple of years before I kind of had my first song recorded. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, thinking wow. that, you know, you think you sign up, oh, great things are going to start happening. But then you got to just start building a catalog for them to, right. s- to start working. Uh, yeah. The same thing kind of happened to me. Uh, I came to town to take a church job that fell through. Mm-hmm. We had no place to live, 40 bucks. <laughs> it was night late, 83. Okay. Uh, just this kid that I met in our apartment complex happened to know Bill Gaither had or Gary okay. McSpadden actually okay. yeah. just happened to know and so he heard my songs introduced me to Gary Gary introduced me to Bill they signed me to a publishing contract I didn't I couldn't write my way out of a paper bag <laughs> but you know by golly, I taught myself yeah. and hung out like you did. You just but it suddenly gave you access, probably, to other people did. at the same stage of development yeah. along the way who were learning together. But I remember Gary and Bill would they'd patiently listen to my songs. I'm not sure why they even let me hang around, but I remember the day that I finally kind of crossed some sort of threshold mm-hmm. somehow because Gary, I, I can see the look on Gary's face when he would. You know, uh, look at it. It's kind of like when you when you look at an ugly baby and you go, <laughs> "Yep, that's a baby." You know that kind of thing, right? Yeah. But I remember the day that I that I finally kind of crossed over this magical mm. threshold, and something jumped up in my understanding. And it, does that make sense? Was it Was in the way a- that they reacted to a song you had written, or did you just kind of have an insight you hadn't had before? Well, I think it was the insight. I okay. think it was the insight of what took me from striving and average to 
okay, I'm starting to get this. Yeah. I'm starting to get the principles. Was there a moment yeah. in your, you said it took you a while before you, you actually got my started first getting cut, cut but, but was there a moment that, a revelation? I don't know that that moment's happened because I'm still striving. <laughs> I'm still trying to turn, you know, what's, where's the next song coming from? I, yeah. I remember a writer say one time, it's like, you always, you have this trust that the first one's going to happen. It's out there. It's got to happen. Once that happens, you're like, oh, no. There's no guarantee of the second one. Sure, you, you sure. Have, you have no, th- you've, you never thought about that before. Yeah. So I remember listening to the to the first song the first time I got it recorded. I was driving back to, to, to my home in Virginia, and we stopped, ironically enough, um, in, in Danville, which is the city where, where my wife and I went to college. And, like, the song came out that day, and we stopped and picked up a cassette at whatever the Christian bookstore was, was along the way and, and listened in the car. And it was like, well, all right. That's what we dreamed about, somebody singing my song. I prayed about that as, as a young guy. God, could there ever be a time where somebody else yeah. would sing my song? Would you ever let me get a song on a record? Would you let me get a song on the radio? Um, and then it happened, and there's like this, well, okay, I better get back to the, I better get going with, with that. And, you know, hopefully you're not betting the bank on one song. You have right. you have so many songs going at any time, but there, it's it's a strange moment. Yeah. Where it's like, okay, what's next? (laughs) Absolutely. I I think what I was really referring to was a little more of the, maybe that first insight of what makes, whether it's economy of words, Mm. whether it's, usually it's the idea, right? I I mean, the hook. Sometimes it's the big idea. What's the the fresh idea? What's the perspective? Um, Sometimes in a a lyric class, uh, uh, I'll... uh, I'll, I'll say, you know, and I believe this, all ideas have been written. Everything has been written. And, and there's not like a new truth that we're telling with the song. There's no new truth. All truth is revealed. Scripture's clear on that. Um, but every window to every big idea has not been looked through. Your window onto the faithfulness of God as you have experienced it, or somebody that I read, what their window on the greatness and the majesty of God. That's I think that's what we're looking for is the, the new windows that people have not been have not and, and it's, it's just telling your story. How are you seeing it in in the light of Scripture? Um, but continuing to look for the big windows and and the big. Idea. I think the I think the big idea is though we search for it, it is completely an unteachable part of songwriting. I don't know how to teach somebody to find the big idea. I know how, I know how to tell them places that you can look. And we've already laughed about rating conversations. And yes, it's having that antenna up. It's what you read. It's what you watch. It's at, it's at all times. I don't know how to, I don't know how to tell somebody that was it. You miss, you miss the big right. idea. Some people just, just kind of, some people too are just better writers. There's some, there are some writers in this town that you just go, oh, what I would give at some point to write as well as Tom Douglas does. That guy's just a better writer than other people. He is just, his skill gift set is just more attuned and and the way that he hears life, he he gets the big truths and the fresh windows to look. And, and they're guys like that. And you just, you keep reaching. Man, you, you stay hungry to keep reaching and improving that way, I think. Wow, that's rich. That's rich. So, where do we jump off from there? So many good things you just said. I love the uh, the concept of of looking through the big window yeah. at the faithfulness of God, the grandeur of this gospel. Yeah, because so how many huge. songs on the faithfulness of God in in all right. years and now have you written? You've written a lot of yeah. songs about that. Some of them probably like, oh, that really moves me. That's really fresh. The others are just as true. There are a lot of true songs, but the window that we look through at them, it, it's very familiar. It's it's very, yeah, other people have written about that, but bringing something different or, or something unique. Yeah. La- I did last year, the, that Natalie Grant song, King of the World, Sam and Becca Mizell wrote that. And it Great just, song. golly, first time I heard it on the radio, just moved me deeply about when did I start to, to think of you as less than who you are, things like that. And when you're the king of the world. It's like that perspective. We we all have wrestled with that, but that song said it 
in such a fresh way that it just it it moved me deeply. I think mm. that's what we're that's what we're looking for. Those windows where oh, you just feel it. Yeah, not a rehash. Yeah, but a new window. Yeah, yeah. So you got the first cut. And yeah, <laughs> you, you bought the, the little cassette in Danville I on did. your way back home. Yeah. So here you are. How many cuts later with? 29 number one yeah. hit songs, yeah. uh, uh, Dove Awards, yeah. all the things we talked about. Yeah. But, but you know, but it's but it's just one song at a time. It's it's not this big sweeping scope of things. I think it's just, and I, I don't think a writer, I don't think a real writer lives with eyes on those things because it's just what is the next song? One right. song at a time. Those things are fun. I mean. Gosh, getting songs on record still is fun. It's yeah. fun to hear a song on the radio or, or anything like that. Um, but it really, the mindset is, what is the next song? What is this next thing that I'm passionate ab- about shaping? Um, I remember somebody, somebody asked Ben Skill, like, what's the song that you're most excited about? And he says, the next one. And, and I think that's true. That's I think that's the the truth for real songwriters. I think if if somebody shows you a song, says, oh, I want you to hear this, give a critique to this, and you look and the song's like six years old, I'm like, hmm, if you wrote your best song six years ago, right. I'm, I'm not as, <clears throat> I'm not as, Willing to wholeheartedly engage the process. Exactly. Them. But if somebody goes, hey, this is something I wrote last month, I'm like, okay, well, let's really lean in here and try to try to give some some help because because it's the difference. I think it was Niles Borp that said, uh, what do you like better, writing or having written? Because the people who like having written will always talk about, oh, this thing that I wrote two years ago, this, this, that's right. yeah. a, a real writer. It's just, it's just about that forward focus and try, right. trying to get to that. That's what I'm excited about. Yeah, a lot of people listening might not know who Niles Borup is, but yeah. he was one of the most influential publishers here for a uh, long, long time. A he great writer and a now. great, great writer. publisher. Down and a, and a, the Via Dolorosa. The da, 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 with Dwight Lyles. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh. Great, great song. song. Great catalog. Great catalog. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. I didn't mean to interrupt you there, no. but but I think that's true. It's that about the forward focus. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've had clients that I've worked with that dredged up songs from 15 years ago, and I'm like, hey. okay, I first of all, I hope that you're not even the same person that you were 15 exactly. years ago, yeah. much less the same kind of writer. Yeah. And one of my pet peeves is, and I'd love for this to kind of move us into maybe a, another section, because here you are, all these songs later, hundreds, maybe thousands of songs you've written, all these hits, and yet you're still going. One of the pet peeves that I, I, I have is that most of the writers that I deal with, aspiring or you know the people that are, are, are in my, my client roster, they just tend to write on empty. It's like hmm. they're, they're not resourcing themselves at all. Hmm. And they're like, how do I find ideas? Yeah. How do I, you know, where's the, and, and it's yeah. like, come on, are you that unresourceful in your life? Are you still wondering where a grocery store is? You know, don't you know where the Kroger is? Yeah. It's right down the street. How to feed yourself exactly. creatively. Exactly. So talk yeah. to us about your process well, in that. Well, we said earlier, anything is fair game, and, and it really is. I mean, I'm I'm a reader. I think most I think most people who are who are lyric writers, who are at least more engaged on that side, are everybody except Dave Clark. He's the, he's the exception to so many rules in this town. Another but, great songwriter, another and great publisher. Songwriter. And you don't know, guys. You, guy, you should have on, have on the show one time. Cause, yeah, because yeah, he yeah. he's taught me so much about songwriting. But yet, as a friend, for, okay, I'll just tell it on him, just because because. Um, we met years ago. And we were put together for an, for an, uh, an uh, assignment that we were to, to work on together. There's two lyric writers together, and, and I and he was enough years ahead of me. Had all those great for him, Phillips, Craig, and Dean, Larnell songs, songs that I just songs. you know I am I'm new to town and I'm just in in my ch- in my church working faithfully like 50 hours a week there writing on Thursdays cuz that was my day off scheduling two appointments but you know and he's just killing it songs all over and so we were put together and I go to his I go to his house to hang out it's like I'm oh, driving over there I'm like I can't wait to see what's on his bookshelf what what he reads what really feeds him <laughs> <laughs> and I walked in. There were no books in the room, but there was the complete VHS series of Hogan's Hero. <laughs> and it just started this mystery. It was like, okay, God, how how does this work? How does, how, does, how does this guy write these profound 
songs, and he watches Hogan's Heroes. I but, can't even remember the theme to that. I grew up on that show too, but <laughs> that was not a favorite show of mine <laughs> along the way. But but I think that I think that I you, you gotta be a reader or. Or if TV or movies is your thing, it's the way that you think analytically to get right. it. Lots of sermons and podcasts. There's always, yeah. I, I just, I just keep a, a list of things in front of me that I'm trying to get to. So. so it's a, it's an awareness. It's just kind of an attitude and a mindset that you're. We talked about having the radar up, but feeding yeah. yourself. Yeah. I, I mean, how can people write great words if they're not filled with great words? I think, yeah. And it's, this, and it's this franticness of always just a tune. What, what's next? It, who, who's saying it? It's in church. It's like having that bulletin with that blank back sheet to it. Like, isn't that just the best thing that churches do? <laughs> Pass out that little blank piece of paper that, during, that during my, the sermon. My Evernote app. I mean, sure. you know, I mean, something. Yeah, they've got to come from somewhere. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. and keeping post-it notes everywhere uh, <laughs> around me, on my desk, my car, bedside table, yeah. all those little things for stuff that you jot down that right. you will forget if you don't if you don't put them down Isn't somewhere. That yeah. That's the truth. So how do you stay current? Mm. <laughs> I, I'm I'm real fortunate to to be uh, I'm with Word Publishing now, and they, and they continue to put me in the room with new people, some new artists, new writers that I've not written with before. I really welcome that as uh, um, getting with new people because I do not know where the next good song is going to come from. I, I, I don't. I don't know what the combination is. I look back on songs that I love that I wrote with somebody. It was like, well, at some point there was a first co-write with them that was like, is this going to work? I don't know. You kind of, and I think you got to give, I think you got to give a new relationship at least three songs to see if that's really, you can't tell something on right. one day. So you, you have a bad day the first one, I have a bad day the second. You, you, you can't really judge that. So there's so a you, jackhammer on the third. <laughs> that's right. It's something. Um, but, but after about three songs in, you can kind of tell. The question is to me, do I feel like they pull the good stuff from me? That's good. There are, there are those people that just for some reason, you feel like you're on in that combination and it, and it just works. And there are people that you might write with for a season you don't write with for a season sometimes some season even in a couple of years and then there's a reason to get back together and you pick right back up but it's but it, it seems like there have always been those relationships for me that one song leads to two songs two songs leads to four songs four songs leads to 40 songs it's just suddenly it just takes mm, off mm. And, and the two of you just hit this really creative spurt together Can so I'm, so I'm always looking for a who those people are? Are you in a current co-writing relationship like that? And who have, who have been your top well, it, one or it, two or three? Well, it's funny because it doesn't feel like it, it feels a little bit more. I think with records being slower coming around, that, that the process is just slowed down. So that you you know it used to be that an, that an artist is if if you're making a record every twelve or eighteen months, it was like. Okay, new record comes out. They go work it hard, come back. We got five, six months to to really be creative. Well, now a record running two to three years, four sometimes on the big years. There's just the the writing cycle with some artists. Is, so it's it's a different rhythm these, right. these days. I feel right, like. right. Well, did you um, write some things with Elisa Turner for the new Integrity record? Couple of, couple of things on her new project. Michael that she, they just released. And, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fair and I've written together a, a lot through the years and um, he was she was one that he brought in into the process I, I met her a couple of times previously like at, at some writing retreats and yeah. stuff like that we had her on the podcast yeah that was a, that was great she is so gifted just love her I heart cried. boy I just cried what a, I mean, what a story I know, right yeah a, a, a difficult a painful story mm -hmm. and yet that just sh just shows God's goodness, faithfulness, and redemption in her, in her life. And, and with her just putting that out there and going, no, this is true in my life, and it's not good, and it's not pretty, but this is true about who God is. Yeah. It, it just moves. So so, so the thought to, to write some songs that hold the tension, hold the truth of that with her, man, good friend. Like yeah. her a lot. Well, I mean, when we when I walked in the room to do the podcast, I'd actually run into her, met her the first time. I think she was there to write with you a word, okay. and I was over there for something and wound up just kind of saying hi to her. Mm. But then when I uh, met her down at the integrity offices and walked in, it was like she had known me for years, <laughs> hugged me. I'm like, 
oh, okay, this girl's friendly. I think I like her. And, <laughs> yeah. and then, but by the time the interview was over, I'm like trying to get her to come over and have dinner with uh, yeah. her and her husband, come over and have dinner with me and my wife. Yeah. And, you know, and so, a great singer and, oh, and communicator. My gosh. Yes, so. absolutely. Do you remember, uh, you said you wrote a couple of songs. Do you remember what they were on that record? Um, uh, yes. Uh, one's called More Than Gonna Make It mm-hmm. and one called Psalm 13. Yeah. The, the EP just came out. So. Right, yeah. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Integrity music worship yeah. artist. Yeah, very cool. Well, let's talk a little bit. I think we've covered some great ground already. Um, you know, spiritual disciplines, you know, I mean, we've talked about how reading and all yeah. of that kind of folds in. I encounter a lot of writers who feel like they should only read the Bible, and that's the primary Boy. book, and I get it. You know, the B I B L E. That's yeah. the book for that's, me. That's the basis, but and, and I mean, that's the that's what you run everything through. That's the most important. But boy, there's so much other great stuff out there. But commentaries have been really helpful for me through the years. Um, just to know, I mean, I, I I get what I get when I read the Bible, but but boy, there are people who understand the original languages who read at a deeper level and then offer us their insights, whether it's a commentary or, or a great pastor, great great Bible expositor. That's always meant a lot. Um, yeah. I, I think, too, I think some, too, it's going back and, um, you know, like at Lifeway stores, the really current stuff's up front and the really old stuff is buried in the back, the kind of the classics. And I think I think it's important to, to read some things that, you read it because you think you ought to read it. Maybe it's maybe it's not exactly what you're going. Oh, I want. But some things that have been significant for me along, along the way are ones that I got. I kind of feel like if I'm going to be a writer, I probably ought. To, I probably at some point ought to really read a systematic theology book just to oh kind of just to kind of ground myself. Oh, in, dude, I'm gonna have in, to in edit a, that out of this podcast. I mean, come on. <laughs> but I mean, well, it's, it's sitting right. It's sitting right there. But I, yeah. But you know, you don't go. Oh, I, I want to do that. But yeah. But you get into it, and there's just. It just feeds you at a level. I don't know. You you don't get a direct song from that, but it alters your your. I don't know. Just kind of the grid that you start to think right. through for songs wow. and, and how you approach because you want to you want to handle truth accurately. You want to be a, a faithful with the word. Well, I, I think I have almost every volume that N.T. Wright has ever written, yeah. but. I've only read a fraction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, who do you read? I mean, well, you know, I, I found recently um, A.W. Pink and A.W. Tozier have been have been really helpful yeah. for me. And then just and fun stuff, too. And John Grisham in the last three years has been oh, has, yeah. has been the good escape okay. from, from just a lot. Just fun stuff. But then some poetry stuff along the way. I don't know. I always it seems to be reading a lot of biographies, a lot of— Music people, yes. songwriters, other performers. Yeah, you were telling me about a book um, before we started the the podcast. Yeah, here. What, what's that a, book? A thing called "Always." There's always magic in the air, and it's kind of a, kind of about the Brill Building era of songwriting. And I think I, I think I'm fascinated by that because I I love so many of those songs, the pop songs that came from that the late '60s and all. Um, but I see just how how they work in little cubicles and little pairs hustling to get on to get on a record with with a, trying to get their publisher to like the song oh, so yeah, he would yeah, go yeah. pitch it um, there're just so many connections to what what really goes on here in Nashville and um, but they were just writing songs wow. like "You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman" and yeah. "Up on the Roof." You got a friend. Oh, yeah. just massive pop songs well, like, let, like that. Let's go back for just a second because some of the listeners might not know what the Brill Building, the Brill Building, B R I L L Brill yeah. Building in, in, New, in York. New York and Times Square, and um, it was a little. I mean, pairs of, of songwriters. And they were like mostly like. Teenagers from Brooklyn coming over, getting pub deals with Don Kirshner um, and Al Nevins at that time, and um, Carol King and her future husband Jerry Goffin, Neil Sedaka, uh, Barry Mann, Cynthia Weil. All of these people. It's like if you want to be a student of songwriting, just go to their website, get a list of their twenty biggest songs, create a Spotify playlist or Apple Music playlist, and just 
listen. These are all master craftsmen at just mm. at great writing. Mm-hmm. And you just really hit on something that I emphasize over and over and over. And we were talking about earlier about uh, writers writing on empty. Mm-hmm. I keep telling them, listen, yeah. listen, listen, listen to music. I mean, listen to conversations and everything <clears throat> we've been talking about, but listen to songs. I mean, but I, th- I think it's too. I think it's not just listen to what you want to listen to. Yeah, yeah, listen, yeah. Listen yeah. if there's an if there's somebody that you are a fan of, find an interview and find what they listened to growing up. Find what what fed them, and then make yourself creative. I, I still do this. I, I mean, I, I'm kind of really late to the Bob Dylan ball game. It was it was only a couple of years back that you know so many. I mean, Billy Joel just lauds Bob Dylan as a writer. I'm such a Billy Joel fan. It's like, well, okay, well then I'm gonna I'm gonna go back and listen to some of the Dylan stuff, and and I get it now. I mean, I, I guess I always found you know more Bob Dylan songs than you think you do, but. I always kind of found the voice a bit off-putting and, and, and never got into it. But to go back and, and to go, okay, get past that and get to the craft of the song. Of, okay, I get Bob Dylan now as, at, a, at a level. So I'm, I'm always doing that. I'm listening to who, who do the writers that I respect. And if there's a name that pops up two or three times, you know, you hear writers go mention Jimmy Webb enough and you go, okay, I need to know, I I right, need to know right. who Jimmy Webb is. Yeah. And then this world opens to you that you're like, Wow, what a craftsman! Yeah, man. and even Dylan was influenced. You know, oh. Woody and Arlo Guthrie, yeah. and and keep even going folk back. song, keep going back and going yeah. back. Yeah. yeah, wow. I think that's it. it you know, it's kind of close to like what I said was not just reading the books you want to read. Read some you ought, ought to, and I, I think you can treat music kind of like that. A- ask a writer or somebody that you respect. Hey, who's somebody that you think would be helpful for me to study? As a writer, I think you can do that with Christian songwriters. I think, I think there's some great writers around. And just study what they've done. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes it's just making a playlist of their songs and living with it. Mm. A lot of people, you know, really uh, dismiss the Christian music yeah. industry these yeah. days, and the artist is shallow and whatever. But the deeper I go into these podcasts and meeting beautiful people, you know, such as Elisa Turner and a bunch of these other people, you can go back and look through the mm-hmm. list of them, but. I'm more and more impressed, actually, with the caliber of people that I'm meeting. Of course, I've been in the industry for 30 years, but uh, to to just, I, I really believe God's still doing a work. You know, He's still mm-hmm. working through all this. But uh, it, you know, to to not be cynical about yeah, it and no. all that kind of stuff. I, I'm not that guy because because I I know what God has done with Christian music in my life. I know mm-hmm. the songs that have fed me, the ones that at a at a low point of life. I remember sitting on church staff and just some really disappointing, tough things happen. Go back, shut the door, flipped on the radio, and for him song, Where There Is Faith, came on. And I just cried like a baby because mm-hmm. of that, that it was saying what I was feeling that time. And, and those songs are like lifelines. They just, it's this life ring that somebody throws out there and it connects the right song at the right moment. Somebody can change a life powerfully. Absolutely. I know because because it's me Because and, and I'm a fan of people who have done that for me and to continue to hear songs. Like, like I mentioned with the Natalie's King of the World, it's like, oh, what that meant to me to be able to say that. Because I think that's what we're doing with great songs is we're giving people the words to say things that they all already feel and think but they just can't quite name it as well and um i think that's a i think that's a good thing to do mm-hmm. um, and I, I still i want to do it I, I the thought of still creating those things that we can throw out there to i mean for whatever the reason is it could be a worship song that turns somebody's eyes to to sing to bless God for something that they've never blessed him for before or something that just gives them a little bit of hope to hang on. You mentioned at least song, More Than Gonna Make It, where I hope for some people going through some tough, tough things to say more than gonna make it. it just it's, it's that, no, I will fight. I will, I will press on and, and find a way to, mm-hmm. to overcome. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. We were talking a minute ago about spiritual disciplines and mm-hmm. about reading things other than the Bible. Yeah. And one of the perennial themes, I, I've had people get really, really angry. I'm going to bring up something controversial, Uh-oh. all right? I'm not a controversial I, I, guy. Yeah, yes, you are. We're going we're gonna to drag you into some controversy mm. here. But it's like people seem to expect God to drop all this on them. 
if they read the Bible enough, if they pray enough, maybe if they tithe or go to church enough, yeah. you know, that they're going to just be walking through the park and God's going to drop these completed songs on them and then they don't really have to learn Boy. anything about the craft. Can you kind of address that so I'm not hanging out here all by yeah, myself? Yeah, you know, I, I, it's it's funny because, it, yeah, you always encounter particularly new writers who, who will say, God gave me this. And the best response, I, I, maybe Randy Cox said this a couple weeks ago on, on your podcast, I'm not sure, but I heard Reggie Ham one time say, well, his response to it was, well, I've heard God write better. And, and, and it's, it's that. Um, it, writing is hard work to do it with excellence. I mean, writing is easy. On one hand, writing with excellence, any type of writing with excellence is hard work. There's so many different angles and, and, and craft things. I think it's tough because a lot of times you'll hear songwriters in interviews, really successful ones go, well, this song came to me in about 30 minutes. And here's, the, here's, what, I, here's what I know in those situations because I remember I, I, I would hear some of those as a young writer and go, well, that's what you want to do. You want to get to the point where you're writing fast. And well, writing fast is nothing. You can write bad songs fast. It's, it's, it's about writing with excellence and the pursuit of excellence, not the pursuit of speed. Um, but I do know that sometimes great craftsmen, because of the 20 years that are behind them of shaping and working, do get songs that come quickly. I've experienced that some in, in the last year. Some songs that I like a lot have come kind of quickly. I think it is easier to write a big idea quickly when it's just so it hits you so fresh so powerful so emotionally that you know what to do with it you just start writing and then there are others there are days where you're just like this is an okay idea and I'm and I'm pushing and I'm working and that's that's valid too that's not a, that's not a bad thing there are songs that just kind of come line by line that you just keep at it. And sometimes you set it aside and you come back to it for three days later and you get a couple more lines, but but you you, you keep it moving along the way. Mm-hmm. So the goal the goal is just excellence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I remember my first big hit was with Larnell Harris and mm-hmm. it was a mighty fortress is our God. God. I knew that record. Bill oh. George, Bill George, the late Bill George, wonderful guy. He had written the entire melody chord structure, everything, oh, wow. note for note. So you had to hit each one of those little oh, melodic notes totally. with, with the right lyric, falling on totally. the right cadence. Totally. Just right. That's tough. Like 100%. That's I had tough. to follow the inflection mm-hmm. of his melody. That's hard. And, and he already had the uh, title. Okay. He handed me this. Well, I mean, he, that's kind of like a gift, though. It was a it, total gift, but I mean, I was just a kid. I mean, I was still just trying to figure it out, right? Yeah. And so, talking about writing fast or slow, I know that I worked on that song for hours every day for mm. about um, eight weeks. Yeah. I mean, it, that was about an eight-week process. I was sweating every oh, syllable sure. because I was trying to match the prosody, the you know, the way exactly. he had written it, and I, I, it was. Talk it's a about, bit of. It's like. Doing a puzzle Total. at some points, like yeah, yeah, that. yeah. But yeah. I learned so much in that, you mm-hmm. know, and it became the foundation. The things I learned through that process, digging deep yeah. for every single word, and having to because you could have taken Mighty Fortress and you could have gone a lot uh, of directions it, yeah. with it, it yeah. and you know, then then I had the whole uh, roller coaster of it was pitched. For Sandy Patty, she was going to do it. Then she dropped it. Greg Nelson loved the, the yeah. song. And those of you listening who might not know who Greg Nelson is, he was like the rock star, all-time inspirational uh, oh. producer, just so, so key in this whole yeah. industry. And really it helped set the foundation for a lot of even His Fingerprints is, as a writer and yes, as a producer. absolutely. Are on hundreds of great Working songs. with great artists. But So he loved the song, and it was going to be uh, on Sandy didn't happen. Mm. And then the Gaither vocal band actually recorded it. And you have to remember, this is like my okay. first cut, right? Yeah. Okay. Was that? So, or, or very, very early on. Okay. And so the Gaither vocal band cut it. I was just thrilled. I thought I had arrived. And then they dropped it from the record. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever get to hear that cut? No, I oh. never heard it. I was just, just I just shed the tears but over it. But then right? you heard the Larnell cut and, and you went, okay, that's where it was then, meant to be. And then Greg produced it on Larnell. And that was a big cut. It was, it was big. And, and, uh, 
uh, and he sings it to this day, you know? So <laughs> it's kind of like... Uh, it, okay, it, then your second cut. Was your second cut <laughs> as good as that? Because that's tough. When yeah. your first one is that massive, that was a gigantic yeah. production, yeah. too. And Larnell, a world-class singer right there, so too. So crazy. So man. sometimes I've seen writers that the first one is that big. Like, it, like if your first cut is a Chris Tomlin cut, it's like right. the second one is not going to be <laughs> no. quite that. <laughs> exactly. It's, t- it, it's tough. Sometimes I, sometimes I think it, it can be really difficult for somebody if their first one is, is that good, as opposed yeah. to working where you, you know, you've just kept slugging on and this is good, this is good. And then you have right. these spikes along the way. I don't remember it was my first, but it was way early okay. in there. But it still, it was a long time before <laughs> I felt like we ever reached that yeah. uh, again. Well, talk a little bit about your songwriting process, because you mentioned a moment ago, uh, sometimes when just those fully grown hooks yeah. hit your head or ideas, and then uh, it, it kind of writes themselves, yeah. the song writes itself. Uh, what? And then you talk about, okay, <laughs> you're kind of pushing sometimes, but... You know, do you, is there a certain process that you have as you think of ideas and refine them, and and then you well, get with a? I think it's right? it's different some during the years because I started off just taking a whole lyric into writing, but that really worked at a, at a time in this town when it was a lot more. Uh, Artists that were looking for outside songs, so so you would get with a writer and write whatever's the best song is two writers in a room you can write that day, and then a publisher go and pitch it. That's not as much what goes on in this time. I'm so grateful to have had a, a, a stretch in in a career where where that was the reality. These days, with less artists cutting outside songs, it's more of getting in the room with. The artist um, asking first if they've got something that they're passionate about saying, and then trying to help shape that in a way. Hey, is this the way you'd say it? Hey, how about this? Or sometimes they go, you know, you, sometimes you catch them on a day when it's like then maybe they've been writing a lot and kind of a little tapped out, and they say, "Well, do you have anything?" And then you can bring in a piece of one of these ideas that that you're passionate about. So I keep, always I keep things all a, a number of songs always at different stages of development. I mean, I've got a folder with some completed lyrics that I could walk in. I've got others where it's like, well, here's a chorus or, or here's a verse. Then, boy, just it just this scratch paper pile of, mm-hmm. well, here's something. Is this a title or is this an opening line? So it's it's always just piles of things at, at different points of development, whatever is the jumping off point. Um, and it's different every day where, where, where whoever you're in the room with, where they want to start off. But but I but the consistent piece for me is I I've, I've got to know what is the big idea, what is the one truth that this song is trying to communicate that because and and, and sometimes I've called that the North Star. I've heard um, I think I think Stephen Sondheim re- referred to it as that. He said he said you need to write in the top left hand column of your page one sentence about what this song is about, and and that sentence dictate. And you don't get a lot. You don't get two sentences because then you're adding stuff to it. One sentence, and every line in this song has to reinforce what that one idea is about. Because um, it's a journey. Every song's a journey. It's taking, we're starting here. And, and if it's a great song, it's a great ride. I've, I've, I've compared them to roller coaster songs. You know, everybody's got, everybody's got their favorite roller coaster in America. Oh, which is the best one? And, and oh, there's that thing where you take off the first climb. That's great. Oh, look at the view. Boom, that first fall, maybe like that first course. Like, oh, I just love that. Then, there, you know, maybe it's a dip, maybe it's a climb, a spin, something like that. But then the great ones are like, have, have like what the bridge would do, save something great for the end. Um, and so you try to make the whole song say that one thing and make it satisfying. And you know the, uh, the songs that just there's like this weird verse or the bridge that was like that bridge didn't really do anything. Right. You, you ran out of gas and um, you just kind of said hallelujah, hallelujah, bless the Lord, and then go back and repeat the, yeah. the bridge because you, you repeat <laughs> the chorus again because because you're you're out. You didn't you didn't outline the idea. I, I know for a long time there, there was. Um, I hit I hit a period years ago where it felt like I had a lot of verse and choruses going, and I couldn't write a second verse. I, I, and I had finished a lot of songs before, but I was just suddenly like unable 
to write a second verse for anything. And, then, and, I, and just had all these half songs and was really frustrated. And, and um, I don't know if it was a magazine article with an interview with a writer or who it was. Oh, I wish I could, wish I could remember. But, but he talked about the plotting and the pacing of a song, kind of outlining, kind of going back to junior high English class where, where you – where the teacher makes you write the outline first of the paper. Um, and so you know, it's not always on paper, but it is certainly in my mind that I'm thinking that. Early, early if we were writing a song and, and we've got a title and an idea on the table and we're starting about, I'm going to start thinking not just what is the first verse about, but what is the second verse about. So I want to save myself at least a couple of words. If I can have two words to write in the margin for that second verse to tell myself I will not say hope in that first verse and I will not say hope in the chorus so that I've got that in the second verse to do it. What I found out, what, what that article that I read helped me find out was sometimes I was in the rush of getting it down on paper. I was saying everything in the first verse and the chorus. And I had really put too much in the first verse. I just needed to, maybe that third line in the first verse was really what the whole second verse needed to be built about. I just needed to, I needed to pace it, kind of outline it better. So. Mm, excellent, that's excellent. Such depth, such richness through this whole discussion so far, Tony. Um, uh, let me ask you a, a question as we sort of begin to bring it in for a landing. If you were to be known for one song, mm. 29 number one mm-hmm. hits, more on the way, uh, you know, how many songs do you think you've even written? A thousand, two thousand? Yeah. A couple thousand anyway. Yeah. So if you could be known for one song, whether it's ever been recorded or not, what would that be? I, I would... I, John, it's like that's just the toughest thing. I, I I would want to think I hadn't written it yet. The songs that mean the most that I have written are the ones that all have a connection to my family somehow. Um, I don't know. I I wish I, I wish I could. <laughs> Uh, there, are, right. there are songs along the way that you go, okay, this is a big piece of the fabric of my heart. Find Your Wings, that wrote with Mark Harris, was a prayer for my kids. Okay, that's that's me just so grateful to get to say If I was going to say it as an artist, this is how I would say it and put it out. Um, others, Point of Grace recorded a song called God Forbid years ago, on, on Life, Love, and Other Mysteries, that is just really a part of the, the, the fabric of me. Um, there's a song, Jesus, Only Jesus, that I wrote just as a, and that was just kind of written out of a quiet time of just personal worship. It's a beautiful and song. So, That's a great, great song. Some, I mean, those are ones that, that, that mean a lot to me. Right. But there are others. Right. Wow. Well, Tony, man, this has been great. I, I wanted to take just a moment to acknowledge you and just recognize your outstanding contribution. I'm looking at your your shelves filled with uh, Dove Awards and ASCAP Awards and uh, uh, walls full of gold records and uh, your name all over, uh, all over Christian music, you know, for the last, how many years? 25? It's about 26 years, 26 as, a, years? as a staff writer. Right. So Grateful for God's goodness at that. The things that I, that I prayed for at one time, God, could there be a time I just kind of write songs about you. Yeah. And, and he has allowed that. Wow. That's so Grateful. beautiful. And and so I just want to, I just want to thank you on behalf of everyone who's ever been touched by one of your songs and probably millions of people who will never know your name. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, they'll know the artist's name yeah. and they'll know how that song made them feel. But you and so many writers are unsung Heroes, you know, it's kind of, kind of a fun artists. part of it too. Yeah. Is you, yeah. you get your, you don't have to go out on weekends. Well, and, as an introvert, you can <laughs> that's, appreciate that. That's right. <laughs> that is. I don't have to stand on stage or I know, anywhere. Right, right. Kind of, and, and, and sweat tra- it out. I'll take the trade off. There you go. But I, but I do want to thank you on behalf of the world that has Thanks, uh, so. loved and appreciated your songs and acknowledge the contribution and all of the behind the scenes, all of the little writer writing rooms and everything that you've gone through to bring uh, these windows 
into the character yeah. and nature and attributes of God yeah. uh, for so many Hope of so. us. If if you were to think of one thing that you would leave with uh, the aspiring songwriters uh, who, like you, dream, feel like their lives would just ch- miraculously change if, if a popular artist sang their song or they heard their songs on the radio yeah. or something like that. Is, is there... Is there one thing that you would leave with them to encourage them today? It, it would have to be the thing that's that's been on my heart a lot recently. And it, it goes back to the passage where, where he's one day to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. He is not going to say, well done, good and successful servant. He's going to say faithful. And so I'm, I'm aware in this season more than any others about it's easy to want to chase success. And we are not called to chase success. We are not called to be successful. And, and it's easy to get distracted. And, and, and in the midst of that, golly, that ugly thing standing over in the shadows the whole time about that is comparison, where you see what the good things that are happening for other people and you don't even... You start to think, well, God's not being that good to me. And uh, gosh, how how disrespectful and how wrong because um, he is writing your story perfectly. He is writing my story perfectly. He has never written my story according to my timetable. It is, it is always slow. And yet I look back and I, and I always call him faithful. It's always perfect what he's doing. And yet in the moment, I sit in that tension of, oh, God, I'm dying here. I'm dying here. You're going you're gonna to show up. And, um, but I know, I do believe it. I still wrestle with, with feeling that. And I, and I don't want to compare what's going with me to anybody else. Because either way, that is, that is such a losing game. If you compare and come up on the short side, oh, it's just like jealousy is standing right there. And that's just vulgar and vile. And, and maybe even worse is if you compare the good things that have happened to you and, and feel better about yourself than other people. It's like, well, that pride is just as ugly as as anything. I, I don't want to do that, but but I'm, I'm I'm aware of the struggle. I think being aware of that is is uh, such a significant part of that. Um, and being and and waking up. Or well, Ecclesiastes says, uh, "Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your with all your might." And so, whether that is writing a song for a church kids choir. Do it with excellence. Because anybody, any writer with any success I've seen, God has elevated a platform that they were already faithful in the little things. And then he just kept giving them a little bit more. I just just don't know people that just suddenly jumped off on a grand platform. It's always a long journey of faithfulness in the small things and then some, some nicer larger opportunities come on that. So it's faithful. That, that, that's the goal. That's what I'm going to wake up tomorrow and go, okay, let's try to be faithful with whatever the opportunities. Some days it's a great, exciting thing. Some days it's something that you go, well, that's not quite as exciting as some other things. But, but I, want to, I, I want to be as excellent in stewarding that as, as, as with everything. Wow. Tony Wood. Man, this has been really rich for me. I, I'm really encouraged. And uh, man, thank you so much for being here today. And I, I really do have one one final question. Okay. All right. Now, during the course of our conversation here over the last uh, however long, however many minutes we've been talking, I I have gotten seven hooks out of what we said. <laughs> and so look me in the eye okay. and All tell right. me how many did I, you get? I, I didn't because I— because I'm so on the spot with having to with having to talk, I really I didn't. Oh. I love it, man. Well, I got seven, and and if I decide to, I might give you a little credit along the way. I, I guess you're not obligated because <laughs> since I drew a hard line early on, you totally but, but did. I'm, but I'm curious to know what you got. Oh so. uh, yeah. All right. Well, Tony Wood, thanks for being on the Song thank Revolution you, John. podcast, and we wish you the best, and thank you for all you've done. We'll see you guys next time on the Song Revolution Podcast. You guys, I'm inviting you. Get out there. Let's start a song revolution. 
Thanks for being here today for the Song Revolution podcast from Nashville Christian Songwriters. We exist to empower you and to bring you some of the greatest inspiration, insights, and important people from the Christian music world to help you write your best and to be heard as the songwriter that you were born to be. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us over on Twitter and Instagram, and connect with us through our Facebook group called Successful Christian Songwriters. Until next time, I'm John Chisholm calling you to a song revolution.